Council team. I'd like to welcome our forward science team with uh, Rob Whitman. Rob, you there? I am. I'm here. Welcome, Rob. We, uh, Rob and I met um, right before the annual event. Uh, he was introduced to the Crown Council in a in a in the typical way. I am in charge of bringing in and and welcoming our resource partners to the Crown Council, and uh, we get referrals from a lot of different areas that say, "Hey, this would be a great." Uh, company to be part of us, but uh, what we do as a team in the Crown Council is try to find uh, companies that can provide solutions, a solution-based company rather than just sell a product. So when it comes to oral cancer screening, um, the Forward Science team was a, 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 a great step in the right direction for us, and I'm, I'm going to tell you why. Um, uh, they they run a company and a program that doesn't just sell a product. Uh, they have an, an incredible philosophy to provide solutions to oral cancer to dental teams, and not just pump out a product that can that can uh, fix or find oral cancer. Uh, so from from our standpoint, finding a company that can provide a solution for you, and at the same time do good. Uh, provide incredible customer support and up-to-date new technology and products. Uh, this is a this is a great company, and and not only that. Um, as an introduction to Rob, uh, Rob has a, an interesting career background. He started at the MD Anderson Cancer Center as a clinical engineer, and uh, he would test and and try to find new and advanced technology for early detection of cervical cancer, and from there, Rob. Uh, moved into an, a, a new uh, a new business uh, a, a, of diagnosing and research development for um, for other companies and a, and a private startup and which led him to the forward science company and the the oral ID product um, so what an incredible background with uh, the MD Anderson group and the MD Anderson Cancer Center um, and now uh, Rob runs his own business he's uh, just recently back from presenting in Atlanta, uh, he runs uh, webinars and training for uh, oral cancer as well as this product on a constant basis, and we're just grateful to have him and uh, and Kelly Kunkel, who who joined us at the annual event. Many of you might have met them. That was kind of their introduction or kickoff to us. So, uh, Rob, I'm going to turn the time over to you. I I know you can <laughs> I know you can use all the time we've got. Uh, Rob just recently told us that he could stretch this webinar to hours, so we're going to give him all the time he can to, to present, and Rob, we're grateful that you're with us. Well, thank you. We, we appreciate the opportunity, and, and I want to thank everybody for, uh, for a great annual event. If, if you didn't get a chance to go, or if you have, I mean, we were there. We got to uh, hold up some signs, which there's a lot of similarities with, uh, with your group and our group. Um, our, we have an ID for Life program, similar to your Smiles for Life. Shine bright. You know, we shine lights as well, so it's it's a great synergy, but even more so, I think the synergy in, in how you guys run your offices and how everybody um, goes about things is very similar to what we do. So I'll get started here. Um, I won't talk about my background much. I really want to get into what we all need to be learning more about, and that's that's oral cancer screening, diagnosing, and what we need to do in, in our offices to change these trends. So I usually start my, my courses by asking this question. And the reason I ask this question is because most people don't understand the answer. Um, I'd say about 80% of the people that we've given this course to would yell out October at this point, and it's not jeopardy. You don't get more points the longer you or the shorter you wait, but April is a World Cancer Awareness Month. Um, that doesn't mean you only screen during April, but what that means is us in the dental industry really need to, to take hold of oral cancer and understand more of the risk factors, the screening techniques, and more how to educate patients. Um, there was a great group that I read an article about what patients really want. You guys may know this great group that put this article out, but if you've read this, this article, this study that they put out, it talks about surveying patients and what patients really want. Uh, and the number one founding, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here, but the number one finding is that 85% of patients want their dentist to check them for oral cancer, but not that many get screened. Um, so the one learning that we'll stress here is you may be doing screenings, but you may not be educating them, so make sure that we talk to patients, educate them about what you're doing differently, how you're doing it, 
and even more so, the next part is some questions that we'll have for you and hopefully we get answered is, what is your oral cancer protocol? Do you use any techniques? Do you use any products? And really that's the action items that we hope you to take here. So um, the guys here, you know, the Stuart and Steve, you guys saved me some time by putting my outline together for me, uh, which I appreciate. So we know that this is what patients want. We know the trend in oral cancer and our goal is that we can change the way you look at these patients. Um, this was a quote that I heard a while back that states, if you change the way you look at things, things that you look at begin to change. And this can be true for life, for relationships, or even more so looking at patients with oral cancer. So if you're looking around the mouth for red lesions or white lesions, maybe we need to look a little differently. Maybe we need to look for anything that's just abnormal. And we'll go over that a little more in depth here. So my, my challenge for everybody here is just change the way you think about that average oral cancer patient because the rates and trends have changed quite a bit. Um, so if you look at cancer in general, the facts and figures of cancer, right now nobody wants to talk about cancer. Everybody wants to call it just the C word because cancer is a, a scary thing to talk about. But if you look at the numbers, right now one out of every two men and one out of every three women will develop some type of cancer throughout their lifetime. So if we take these numbers away, because I'm an engineer and I love numbers, but take these numbers away and think of real people. So the average American family right now is five people. So if you look at the screen right now, this is my family growing up. It was me and my dad. I had two older sisters and my mom. So numbers would tell me that the average American family, me or my dad, will develop cancer at some time, at some time in our lifetime. One of my two sisters or my mom will develop cancer. That's pretty startling when it hits home and when we have the ability to, to change these trends. So we know right now cancer is the number one cause of death in the world. We also know that third world countries may not have the technology that we do here in the United States. So in the United States, cancer is not the number one cause of death. But we're projecting by 2030, new cancer cases are going to rise in so much that cancer here in the United States is going to be the number one cause of death. So if we start thinking about you know, friends and family members that we all know somebody that's experienced the C word or sometimes we have ourselves, it's scary to start to think about these numbers and trends. Um, so that's the bad news. The good news is just because you're diagnosed with cancer doesn't mean it's the end of the road. There's a lot of patients that are diagnosed with cancer that have a great survival rate. Um, the way we look at survival rates in the cancer world is five-year survival which is a pet peeve of mine. So if I'm diagnosed today and I die five years and a day from now, by definition I'm a success in the books. I don't look at that as success. I feel like I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to haunt my wife for like another 150 years. So um, I don't feel that that's a great survival rate, but that's the way that the C reports and the cancer reports look at numbers. So if you look at the numbers of most major cancers, and you can see it here, whether it's breast cancer, prostate cancer, we're seeing a very good success rate in long-term, so in five-year survival throughout the course of the past three decades. And that's because of better screening methods, early detection methods, uh, increased public awareness. That's the good news. The bad news is we're here for a reason, right? There's one cancer out of all major cancers that has not changed its mortality rate in the past three decades. The survival rate has stayed the same for oral cancer, and that's right about 60, 62 percent. So if you have that percentage rate, that's a huge concern. But even more so, we're now seeing the number of oral cancers, meaning the incidence rate, the number of patients diagnosed every single year in the United States have increased. And these numbers aren't increasing by 10 patients, by 20 patients. These numbers since 2011 have almost doubled. And they're projecting, of course, this year, to be 48,000, which has almost doubled since 2011. So you don't have to be a math major or an engineer to figure this out. If you have more patients diagnosed every year and you have the same percentages are dying, that means more people are dying every year from oral cancer. Right now, one American dies every hour from oral cancer. So by the time we finish this webinar, somebody has died in the United States from oral cancer. And that's the scary thing is that we've been saying this statistic probably for 20 years. It hasn't changed drastically in the better. Um, so the first take home that I'll tell everybody is, have you been screened? 
please make sure you get off this webinar, you get off this recording, you go to your team, you guys do good for your patients, but make sure you do good for each other. You'd be surprised at how many times people incorporate this technology. You find great things for your patients, but you don't always have time to screen each other. So I urge everybody here to screen your staff and screen yourselves and make sure that you get screened. Um, and then the second thing to look at is who do you screen? So if you look at the demographic that we're learning about now, um, we know that oral cancer doesn't discriminate. It affects all walks of life. And that's, I think, the most, that's the scariest part with what we're learning right now about oral cancer is the fact that this traditional risk factor group that we're so used to hearing about, we know we're supposed to screen the smokers, the tobacco users. Um, we're supposed to use these patients that are alcohol users, and then older patients in previous history of cancer. So that's what the ADA teaches you. That's what the ADA says. But the concern is, right now, we're finding oral cancers in patients that don't smoke, don't drink, don't chew tobacco, and they're under the age of 40 years old. So you have that 27-year-old patient that walks in your door, and that patient doesn't have any risk factors, right? You have the patient questionnaire, the risk factor check, I don't smoke, I don't drink, because they're not going to say if they do anyway, and they're under 40. So in theory, you shouldn't have to screen that patient. 60% of those patients are the ones that are getting oral cancer right now. And that's the scary part of what we're learning so much about is, is as everybody will tell you, the, the scariest thing about learning more is you learn as much as, as you know, and then you realize that, wow, we don't know as much as we'd like to know. We know right now that HPV is the fastest growing oral cancer population that we see. It's happening to patients under the age of 40 years of age, and it's a five-fold increase. So the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, recommends screening annually for oral cancer for patients that are 17 years of age and annually. And that's really one of the, the number one take-homes is if you're going to screen your patients, let's make sure we screen the right population. Whether that patient's 17, 18, 24, 14, whatever that age group that you feel pro proper in your protocol in your office, let's screen these younger patients because sometimes these are the ones that we're finding oral cancer and HPV relationships too. Um, so you can look at the studies from a lot of these vaccines, and, and we don't always recommend vaccines or whatnot, but if you look at the Gardasil numbers, the one thing these, these drug companies do very well is they do a very good job at market research. And what they found was we're seeing 15 and 18 year olds, 25 and 50 percent sexually active. That's where we're seeing this HPV virus come from. So pretty sure we don't need to draw stick figures. The same HPV virus that's being found in the cervix is now being found in the mouth. And it's causing mainly the oral pharyngeal, which is the back of the throat cancers, but it's also causing such a, such a high increase in oral cancers. So if you look at the trends in the past three decades, the good news is HPV negative oral cancer has been declining. You know, we're educating people to stop smoking. Uh, I played college baseball and there's some great programs that are trying to get kids to stop chewing tobacco. That's a great thing to see. So we're seeing a decline in that market, but of course, the increase of HPV positive oral cancers of 225% is the true concern. And that's really what we're concerned about today. So this is kind of some of the information that we have. Our biggest thing that we try to do is make sure that you educate your patients properly. So on our brochures, this is something that we have to educate patients to make sure they understand who's at risk so that you don't have to sit here and have this HPV conversation. You can just say, right now, we don't always know the answer, but we know that we're finding HPV in younger patients. We're finding risk factors in older patients. The main thing that we want to do here is we need to screen everybody because if we screen it, we're able to find it earlier. And that's truly the goal is early discovery is the key. Um, so again, HPV is the big reason that people are talking about the sex, drugs, and oral cancer. It's, it's the title that gets people to read a brochure just as much as it gets people to watch a webinar. Uh, but it is a topic that, that needs to be discussed because it is causing this, this high increase of oral cancers. Um, so regardless of what type of cancer it is, whether it's cervical cancer, breast cancer, oral cancer, we know screening is essential. And we know that early discovery can change these patients' lives. Uh, this is a patient that I'm a good friend with. He was diagnosed at 29 years of age. Uh, he went to his dental office every six months, and they never found anything until one day it was a stage four metastatic oral cancer and he had less than a 20% chance to live. 
Um, he is now in his six-year birthday. In the cancer world, they celebrate birthdays, which is a great marketing slogan, by the way. Um, and he's officially a statistic of success in the books. But he'll tell you that just because he made it and he's success, successful in the books, he struggles eating every day. He struggles walking every day. I spent uh, a few hours with him in Washington um, at a Starbucks because that's where he lives. And I asked him, what's the most difficult things you deal with on a daily basis? And he said, the two things that I deal with are not people staring at me, which, which happens in abundance. It's the fact that I had half of my leg removed to reconstruct my jaw, so I can't walk. And I was a cross-country runner. So you can imagine trying to walk when you used to run for a living. And even more so, he said, I, went, I go every night, I kiss my two sons, and my wife go to bed at night, and I don't feel a thing. So all these people look at me like, oh, you made it five years, and you know, you're, you're pushing through it. He said, every single night I'm reminded when I can't even kiss my loved ones good night. And that's our goal. Is our goal, or our goal collectively, should be we're not just trying to find it so that we can save their lives, which is the goal. We're finding it so that it, when we do find it early enough and they do live 10, 20, 50 years, their lifestyle isn't detrimental to what, what it could be if we find it late. So late stage discovery is costly, but in the oral cavity, we're seeing that suicide rates are increasing dramatically. The amount of money spent on head and neck cancer is increasing as, 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 as high as any other cancer. Uh, and it's a pretty deforming disease because you can know, you know when a patient's going through it. Um, so again, we stress early discovery. Along with any cancer, you're going to you're going to see this chart very synonymous to most cancers. If you find cancer in stage one or stage two, we probably have a pretty high success rate for this patient long term. Later stages, cancer metastasizes, it moves throughout the body. We have a harder chance to catch it and a harder chance to remove it and have this patient longer living. So. This is, again, very similar to most cancers, but the concerning part with oral cancer is most oral cancers, 63% of them, are found when it's stage 3, stage 4. And this is really where we'll challenge you all to, to change the way you look at these patients because right now, by the time you see a red lesion, you see a white lesion, or you feel a lump or bump, studies will show that those lesions are a secondary tumor that means the initial tumor started somewhere else. We just couldn't see it. And that's the concerning part. We need to find the tumor when it's just a minor, small change in the tissue, when the patient doesn't feel pain yet. And at that point, that's the difference between 85%, 83% success rate, and 34% success rate. So changing the way we look at this patients, trying to find a more proactive solution. You know, my background is in the medical world. I was in cervical cancer screening for a while. And in 1950, there was a pap smear created. So what did the pap smear do? The pap smear made every OB-GYN oncologist proactive, and they did a pap smear on a female every single year over the age of 40. That changed the trends from 45,000 in cervical cancer to 11,000. It wasn't the test that changed the trends. The test was a 50% accurate test. It was the fact that these doctors were being proactive. We'd rather know we don't have cancer than not know we do and go that route. Whereas I feel like a lot of times patients come in and complain of pain and then we treat the symptoms and that's not always the case. Uh, usually that's a later stage. So one of, the, one of the best examples that I explain to be more proactive about it is we look at the dermatology market. Um, you go out, if, if you have anybody with premal acidic dysplasia, my wife had premal acidic dysplasia in her leg. So every year we go get three moles cut out. Why three? She wants none, I want five. We settle at three. So every year we go to the dermatologist, we get three moles cut out, we get the, the, the pathology report and it's negative. I'm not mad it's negative, I'm ecstatic. It's a long week that I have to wait for that report, but I'm happy to find out that nothing's, all, nothing's going on with my wife. So that's really the mindset we should take is when we have that patient back in two weeks, and we'll go over the protocol here shortly, it's a great conversation to have to say, Rob, you know what? Nothing's going on here. It resolved. Or, you know what, Rob? We did a cytology. We did a biopsy, and there's no findings here. It's just some sort of lichen planus or maybe some inflammation. That's a great conversation to have. So trying to, to take the mindset that way, and again, changing the way you look at these patients. Um, we want to catch it early. 17 years of age and annually is something that we really want to stress. We want to screen younger patients. And then really using adjunctive technologies. 
you're going to have some some technologies and some products out there that are on the market that really can help you understand what you're looking for and really very easy to implement. And I'll go over kind of the fact oral health protocol and what we've come up with and a lot of our specialists have come up with with us. Um, so this is kind of the opportunity that you have with oral cancer screening. You know, anything that we do, you kind of want to make sure that it makes financial sense, that you can market your practice and increase revenue, but also for us, we want to make sure that we do good for our patients and saving lives is really what we're excited about here at Ford Science. So whenever you look at a complete oral wellness program, there's typically three different factors in them. There's a screening factor that you all mainly do in your office. There's a diagnostic factor that you can do some of it in your office, and then of course the biopsies as well in your office or specialist, and then treatment options um, for certain you know, cancers or other types of things with patients. So I'll cover the first two in depth and then the treatment option just a little bit, and then um, we'll kind of go from there. But the screening option is what we always recommend, the FACT oral health protocol. So what that stands for is the fluorescence assessment and cytology testing. Um, and when you go in to understand that, the first part of the FACT oral health protocol is always going to be your conventional white light exam and your palpations. That's always going to be there. You have to make sure that you do that. We have to make sure we feel around lumps or bumps in the neck. Uh, the scary thing right now about HPV-related cancer is a lot of times it happens in the oral pharynx where you cannot see. I don't care if you have the, I've tried in the mirror pulling my tongue out. It's just pretty difficult to do. So you find it a lot of times in the neck area with the lymph nodes inflamed. So we really need to make sure that we, we always do this part, the white light exam in the mouth, intraoral, and then you take your fluorescence device out, um, whether it's Velscope Identify, oral ID. Uh, we've worked with all the companies in some form or fashion, so it's the same technology, different form factors. Um, fluorescence technology is something that you're able to see these lesions a lot earlier, but that doesn't mean it's cancer. It's still a screening tool. If you see a lesion that's dark with fluorescence, and again, I'll show you pictures here in a minute, you see a lesion that's dark, what do we do? We have that patient back in two weeks. If that lesion's too dark, still dark, then we take the next step. If it's abnormal, I mean, if it's normal, and it comes back like it's a healed lesion, then we have that patient back in their next hygiene visit. So it's a very, very simple two-step process for fluorescence. Screen the patient, have them back in two weeks. If that's still there, it's probably not some sort of trauma. You're going to get a burner bite that's going to appear dark, but if it's still there in two weeks, it's probably not going to be a burner bite. So we need to take that next step. Cytology testing or biopsies are the two next steps. And we'll go over the difference in, in the smear cytology and the liquid-based advanced cytology that, that's available now in the market. Um, then, of course, biopsies are always the gold standard. So if you look at the fluorescence assessment, cytology testing, with fluorescence technology, it's been used in many different parts of the body uh, for a very long time. If you ever had an upper or lower endoscopy done with that Olympus green light, that is fluorescence technology. So Olympus is just smarter than us, and they just call it a green light because fluorescence is very hard to say and even harder to spell, especially for an engineer. So um, in the cervix, the lung, we're doing some studies in the derm world, but mainly in the oral cavity is where this technology is used as a screening tool. And that's really what we're excited about. We've been doing this research for a long time. Um, anybody's ever come to Houston and you, you fly into the airport, this is the, this is the sign that you see for MD Anderson. It just says one goal, end cancer. And that's pretty impressive marketing when that's your marketing program. But it's great to be able to work with such a, an advanced institution like this. We're doing some studies with them now. But a lot of this technology was developed there. And we've been doing some great stuff, advancements with it. So if you look at how it works, if you ever want to know truly how it works a lot more in depth, I'll tell you I welcome your phone calls. But I'll give you the brief overview. There are certain fluorophores in the tissue that fluoresce naturally. NADH, FAD, then you have collagen crosslinks that fluoresce naturally. So you shine a bright light on the tissue, and now you have this nice, healthy fluorescence back. Well, as cancer progresses, as Krebs cycle occurs, you probably never thought you'd see Krebs cycle again in your life, but here it is. As Krebs cycle occurs, we use those fluorophores for our energy. So if they're being used up, you have less of them, which creates less fluorescence. In addition to that, we also have collagen crosslinks, be, crosslinks being broken down. So if collagen fluoresces naturally and they're being broken down, that means there's less fluorescence there as well. So that's my attempt at kind of keeping it simple. In 
in short terms, there's three different ways that you're going to start to see dark lesions. You're going to see thermal damage, mechanical damage, and chemical changes. And these chemical changes are what we're worried about, right? This is the NADH, FADH ratio. This is the things that we're looking at for the cancer metabolism. But thermal and mechanical, burns and bites. So the one thing we want to stress with fluorescence is everything dark is not cancer. It is not a detection device. It's just like your loops. It's going to help you see these changes earlier, but you have to understand, right, buccal mucosa, patient's a grinder, you see with the white light, it's going to look a little dark. <coughs> patient complains about seeing their back of their throat, they just burn their mouth with coffee, well, guess what? Now they're going to be a little dark spot towards the back of their throat. Um, so there's things that we have to know going into the screening, but know that how do you decipher between the burn and bite and cancer? That two-week follow-up that we talked about. So having that patient back in two weeks, your mouth regenerates and you're going to have that healed at that point. So again, looking at fluorescence, you're going to see a nice healthy tissue fluoresce. Anything abnormal is going to appear dark. Dark is abnormal. Notice I'm not saying dark is cancer. Because dark is abnormal. We don't know what that is yet, but we have a better understanding that that's not supposed to be there. And the way this technology works is it penetrates way past the basement membrane where cancer begins. And it gives us the ability to see the changes before they metastasize, before they're life-threatening. That's really the main goal behind this. If you don't use fluorescence until you see a lesion, then don't use fluorescence at all. You already saw the lesion. So that's really the main goal behind this. If you're a specialist and use it for biopsies, then we've, we've used fluorescence in the past for surgical margins. But if you're in the general screening population, then you use fluorescence for lesions that you don't see yet if you're trying to find it so much earlier. What I'll do is I'll go over some images here that we have. We have an abundance of more images on our website, or I can email them to you all afterwards. Um, but this is a nice, healthy lateral border of the tongue. You're going to see here on the right with the oral ID device that you're going to see blood vessels. Blood vessels absorb this wavelength. That's a good thing. So you're going to see patients with nice, he healthy blood cells, blood flow. Um, the tongue, the back of the throat, the oral pharynx, we've seen a lot of bacteria, plaque, uh, candida albicans, thrush, fluoresce red and orange. So you put this in the hygiene op, hygienists tend to, flag, tend to love to see the, the plaque and bacteria infections, and now you can educate patients on their risk factors for you know, now a whole litany of other things that we're concerned about. So that's another kind of added bonus with fluorescence. But really what we're looking for is these, these distinct changes that we don't really know what they are yet, but now you see on the right side it's a lot more pronounced, it's a lot worse. Have the patient back in two weeks and reevaluate that lesion. And this is where I usually stress that when you communicate to a patient what you're doing, you're not saying, Rob, I'm doing an oral cancer exam, and you know what? You're positive. I need to see you back in two weeks. Because what's my initial assumption that you just told me? That I have cancer. So really the better verbiage, and this is what, what was written in that article um, that Steve and them did, was maybe you, you portray it as, look, we're doing a complete oral health assessment. We're not looking for just cancer. We're looking for anything abnormal that may cause your body harm. And you know what? We found a lesion that we're concerned about. We'd love to have you back in two weeks. It may be something severe. It may be something minor. But we'll know a lot more in two weeks. Let me take a quick picture and find out what that is. And if they come back in two weeks and it's not there, it's a great conversation to have. No patient's ever going to complain that you just told them they didn't have cancer and they had to miss work for two hours. They will thank you. I promise you. You'll get more referrals that way. But knowing the risk factors, knowing how to communicate with patients is essential, and that's what, what we'll help with doing. But this patient turned out to be a dysplastic tissue. This is an early stage lesion that right now we have over a 90% chance for survival rate for this patient. Again, lesions like this, palate area. This initially was clinically diagnosed as candida albicans. Um, midline is a little more red in person, but now we see it's a pretty distinct dark spot. Clinicians said, you know what, maybe it's not what I thought it was. Moderate dysplasia. Lesions like this on the, on the lip. It's a lot more dark. It's a lot more pronounced. This was an HPV lesion. So again, these, all these lesions are not going to turn into cancer, guaranteed, but there's still a concern. This is a lesion on the tongue that patient didn't see anything, hygienist didn't see anything, dentist didn't see anything, and then finally after time they said, you know what, there's a little something going on with this device. Let me see what this is. This turned out to be invasive, minimally invasive squamous cell carcinoma, but it's HPV positive. If we're all waiting for a lesion like this, then we don't need a device. If we see a lesion like this, 
We don't need to take a device out and say, you know what, this is a pretty distinct dark spot. We know this is invasive squamous cell carcinoma. This is a pretty bad case. What concerns me about this case is the fact that this office monitored this lesion for three years because their mindset was, well, it's not getting any worse. The theory should be, is it getting any better? And that's the difference between proactive and reactive mindset is, you know what, let's continue to monitor this. Well, that's the concern these days is continue to monitor it. Two years later, now it's invasive cancer. But if we say, you know what, something's going on there and that didn't get better in two weeks, let's find out what it is. Let's take that next step. And that's really what we're trying to do here. One more picture, I think one or two more pictures. This is a lesion for one of the docs in our area. She took a look. Patient, of course, was a 49-year-old nurse, and the whole area was black, just completely distinct and dark. She was immediately concerned. Patient immediately went out for a biopsy. And this was an aggressive amyloblastoma. So if you Google amyloblastoma, this is what shows up. So all these people that are asking the false positive rate of these devices, by definition, if you're screening for cancer only and you find this, that's a false positive. An amyloblastoma is a benign tumor. The issue is this is never going to go away. It's going to continue to come back. So this patient had to have half her jaw removed to get this, these cells that were, that were going to continue to regenerate out of her mouth. And that's the concern is, is all these things that are small, subtle changes that in the future are going to cause this patient harm. Maybe not always cancer, but there's other things that we're worried about. And the last picture I'll show you is back of the throat, oral pharynx. Right now, 70 million Americans suffer from, gas, uh, from GERD. And acid in our mouth is a huge issue right now. We know that we're looking at it in studies for teeth. What, are, what does acid do in the teeth? Well, guess what's next to the teeth? The tissue. This patient had GERD, the ENT diagnosed her, and the ENT told her, if you don't change your diet and change the way you sleep, in the next two to three years, you're going to form your own cancer. These are the things we're trying to find, these patients that have these small, subtle changes in the back of the throat. This was actually a hygienist that we found at a screening event in Florida. So this picture was taken outside. Um, we do a lot of screening events uh, in the public that we can do to give back. So if you look at these lesions, remember that these devices are not detection devices. They're discovery devices. We're looking at these, these technologies to make sure that we, we gain more knowledge, but it's not going to have a red flag and pop up and say cancer. We still need to do our differential diagnosis. We need to understand oral pathology. We need to have a proper protocol to do so. So look for the red flags. When you see a lesion you're concerned about, we want to document it, mouth maps, clinical images, all those other things that you're used to doing. I'm just going to reiterate because this is the important part of documentation when that patient does come back, we have a good point of reference with what we're looking at. Um, all the pictures that we actually take, we have a smart filter. So we know the concern in an office. It's hard to take pictures. We pop a little filter on a smartphone, and that's how I took my pictures. So I can tell you if, if I can do it, then you can do it. Um, and then the next part of the protocol is finding out what's going on with the tissue. Now you see a lesion. Now they're back in two weeks. Let's do that diagnosis. And that's really where the next step is that we all need to, to understand more because there's a lot of lesions that you have in your office that come back in two weeks and you're still concerned about. Whether you're 5% concerned or 95% concerned, you're still concerned. Specialists can do biopsies, but they don't always get there to do a biopsy. So really understanding the cytology testing is important to, to implementing the FACT oral health protocol. So if you look at the biopsy of the world, we know biopsies are the gold standard. If you ever think a patient has cancer, we're going to do a biopsy right away. So that's the first step. If you think the patient 95% sure that that's lichen planus, or it's a cheek bite, and it hadn't resolved in two weeks, if you're 95% sure, that means you're what? That means you're 5% unsure, right? That's where cytology testing comes in. It's an intermediary test to have a better understanding with what's going on with the tissue. So we can do some quantified diagnostics to then say, do we need to do a biopsy or not? And that's really where we'd like to be. So if you look at the, the evolution of cytology, um, most of you all are probably familiar with the swabs or the, the smear cytology that's been on the market since 1950, 1960, which is called the pap smear. Oral CDX is what it is in the dental market. And what they would do is they would take a wiry brush, draw some blood on the cells, put it on a slide. You would make the slide, and then you would send it into a pathologist. The concern with that is, besides it being invasive, this, the pathologist gets clumps of cells. So a lot of times you'd get a diagnosis that said atypia, which meant 
we don't really know what's going on, so go do a biopsy. And that's the concerning thing. If, if in your market, if you're going to do five cytologies and they're going to say atypia every time, then why would you do them? So now in liquid-based cytology, we're able to do what they're doing in cervical right now. Cervical isn't doing pap smears anymore. We call it pap smears for cervical cancer because same reason I call Kleenex Kleenex. I buy Costco tissue paper, but I call it Kleenex. So that's it's the brand name that we hear about all the time. But now in liquid-based cytology, it's not a thin, wiry brush. It's a very soft swab. You don't have to draw blood. The process that's done in-house now creates a monolayer of cells. What that means is we're going to have one layer of cells. So the pathologist is going to be able to read exactly what the diagnosis is. So whether it's candida albicans, whether it's dysplasia, whether it's cancer, whether it's herpes, we're going to be able to give you a definitive diagnosis of what that is. And then we can come up with a treatment option together with that patient or for that patient. So this is the difference between smear cytology and liquid-based cytology. And this is really where the market's going. So again, cytology is a great intermediary test. It's for a lot of different patients that you may have in your office. But remember, if you think that patient has the C word and that red and ulcerated bloody lesion comes in, we're going to do a biopsy right away. So it's not a biopsy replacement. Um, it's a really good test that we've had benefits with. And if you look at the cytology screening report, again, we're not going to just say yes or no for cancer. It's going to be de descriptive. It's going to talk about maybe it's from acute inflammation. Maybe it's chronic inflammation. There's excessive bacteria in this patient. Uh, we're doing a lot of studies right now with looking at bacteria from the implant site. You know, a doctor puts in an implant, and maybe you do a cytology on the site and find out if there's a bacterial load in there before they you know, see if it integrates. So there's a lot of different things you can use it for, but really understanding that it's a great knowledge base to get some collect some information and be able to better decide what to do with this patient. Um, so that's really the benefit of it, of what you're looking at for cytology. And again, there's other tests on the market that you can utilize that, that uh, we have as part of our D for Life program. And the last thing I'll cover real quick before I kind of get to the marketing part is treat. There are a lot of different patients that we've dealt with, uh, whether it's cancer patients or you know, generic patients that are going through old age or whatnot from uh, dry mouth issues. But we have patients that are dealing with xerostomia, mucositis, and pH imbalance. And there's a lot of xerostomia issues that we've been dealing with throughout the course of, of our existence, whether it's, again, cancer patients going through chemo and radiation, or if it's patients that are just medically induced xerostomia, um, or Sjogren's syndrome, disease-induced xerostomia. So the one thing that we've done a lot of research on is, is the options for dry mouth and xerostomia. Um, there's options out there for the over-the-counter, which work uh, to a certain extent. You know, a lot of the biotines of the world that we hear about, they're more masking this, the pain, masking the issue. And then you look at the prescription options, and that's where really we like to be with supersaturated calcium phosphate rinses. So this is a webinar for a whole other conversation, but I usually like to talk about um, the options for that. This is the product that, that we have as part of our program, but Saliva Max has helped out a lot with patients for, for dry mouth issues. Um, so again, this is the, the whole program. Hopefully this was beneficial. The next part of any program you look for is, is ways to differentiate your practice and increase revenue. Um, and not always in that order, but being able to do that, we know most offices check the for-profit box. So there is an insurance code. Uh, we like to, to be clear that it's dental insurance, so it doesn't always cover. There's different ways that you have to kind of make sure that it gets covered, and we help you with that, making sure the note sections are right, making sure that it's done right. But a lot of times when you verbalize it to your patients, you don't always say, if your insurance covers, it's going to be X. Most for offices, what we recommend is build their insurance, and if you get it, that's, that's great. But realistically, present to patients as, as a necessity test. Now, hey, Rob, we're doing uh, a new device here. We're doing a complete oral health pro protocol. Uh, part of it is a new oral cancer screening that we do. So it's going to be $20 here today. Um, I know that you probably get a, you know, a pap smear done every year, a mammogram. Excuse me, that's not for me. PSA test for me or Miss Smith, a pap smear or mammogram. Um, so we're going to go ahead and go ahead and bill you that $20 copay or whatever that may be. Most of our offices have success with educating patients. Patients are willing to pay for things if you educate them on the need for doing it. You know, Rob, this is worse than all the other cancers combined right now. We truly believe in this technology here. We're going to go ahead and it's a $20 fee or whatever it may be. So if you look at that, app, that opportunity, we know there's an opportunity for 
return on investment, production increase, um, and then saving a person's life, and that's the priceless part of it. I mean, talk about the ultimate do-good is when you have that patient sitting in the chair that you could say, Rob, great news. I found it when it's stage one. And yeah, some people would be scared to have that conversation, but that's a lot better news than the contrary. Um, so that's a great way to do about it. There's cytology codes, and when you do the cytology testing, there's codes for that as well. Again, all the things that we help you with. Patient referrals are something that's extremely important these days. I know I'm preaching to the choir with you all. So that's something that we've seen success with. Maybe you, you hand out a patient referral card for a free oral cancer screening. That's something that you can do pretty easily. And then the marketing aspect of it. Um, you guys do it better than anybody that I've seen, so uh, I could probably omit this whole last section, but marketing of what you do is important. I'm a patient. I'm not a clinician. I like to understand what people are doing. Uh, when my dentist screens me, when he educates me, it, it makes me better understand what he's doing, but also makes me tell my friends, hey, you need to go see this doc. So make sure that you put it on your website, what you do. Put on social media. Uh, we do videos for our offices. We help them with content. Um, you know, if you're doing the, the whitening for life deals, how about oral cancer screening for life? Things of that nature that we're seeing success with. We have one office that did free screenings for the whole year for their 25th anniversary just in, in appreciation for their patients. Or the social signs that you guys are, are so used to. Uh, we have great marketing stuff that you can put out your offices, have your patients do that. We give you Facebook content to put out on a monthly basis. That's essential through any marketing program nowadays with social media going so viral. You can really put out some great social media posts and it costs you, you know, barely any money to get those referrals. And then the other types of marketing, whether it's local events, screening events, things of that nature. So this is really what we're excited about, being able to, to partner together and really change the trends. Uh, we do a lot of outreach programs. I wish we could say we raised $600,000 for, uh, for a nonprofit. So I, we're working there. Um, <laughs> kudos to you guys for doing that. So I'll, I'll end with this. I mean, our goal is to, to change the trends. And, at the end of the day, we can do some great stuff at Forward Science, but we're not clinicians. We don't get to sit in the chair next to the patient and, and do the work. So we ask you all to just change the way you think of these patients. And, and our goal is to end cancer, um, oral cancer at least. So on our website, I'm happy to say it's out of date. We have a live save ticker that keeps going up. And we love to hear the stories back from offices like yours. So this is all of our information. Um, our Facebook page has a lot of good content. The one thing that we do is we have a charity campaign. For every 500 likes that we get on Facebook, we donate a device to a nonprofit. The great news is we ask for suggestions for what nonprofits. Maybe your nonprofit is the, the way to go. So if we get 500 likes and we can donate a device, and then you guys can use it all across the world when you do your travels. Um, and that's everything. Again, I appreciate your time today and the opportunity to, to work with such a great group. This is our information. If you want a copy of, of our fact oral health protocol that we have kind of lined out step by step of what you can do, just send us an, inf an email to info at forwardscience.com and just reference Crown Council and, and we'll take care of that and we'll get that out for you. So Stuart, Steve, thank you guys for the opportunity and, and I'm here for questions. Very good, Rob. Hey, Greg, are you there? Thank you, Excuse Rob. Excuse me, I had hey, muted, uh, my, muted, my, I'd muted oh, myself. Sorry. I'm sorry. Greg's in I've charge got one of the, question. the questions and comments. Okay, very good. Um, although you've, you've kind of talked about this a little bit, Rob, mm -hmm. uh, the question came up, uh, you see a lot of dental offices that have been most successful in, in implementing oral cancer screening in their practice. What would you say are the the best practices or or the things that those offices are doing that we ought to replicate? Oh, man, it's a loaded question. Uh, it, it it's hard because it depends on you know city, state, what area of the town are you in. You know, some of our most successful offices still charge for it, but educate the patient on why they do it. And then some of our other most successful offices are in a higher end area. And they just say, look, this is free oral cancer screening because they get more referrals. But the one thing that's consistent in all of them that I will say is the patient communication. You know, and, and again, this is in the, the what patients really want letter that you got or the, the study that you guys did. But it's sitting next to the patient in the chair doing the oral cancer screening and say, have you ever had anybody do this before? 
If not, you know, tell me why. Do you know that this is a huge risk factor? So it's, it's having that conversation of not just going there with a blue light and saying, okay, you look good, but really educating them why you're doing it and now talking about, hey, every six months, I don't want to see you back for your cleaning. I need to see you back because, you know what, yeah, we need to make sure that your teeth are clean, but I need to make sure that I check you for gingivitis, that you're, you're not getting HPV, you're not getting oral cancer. I need to make sure that we do our complete oral health assessment because right now with oral cancer on the rise, we don't know who's getting it. And the best way to fight anything is early discovery. So it's really just their commitment to, to making sure that the communication is there with their patients. It's not even a charging issue. It's, is really the education and the marketing aspect of it. Uh, excellent. The, yes, the uh, second question is, uh, you can put your attorney hat on here, I guess. <laughs> um, so, so let's say you, you, do a bi or you, do a, you do a screening and, and you see somebody that you really think needs to be referred out for a biopsy. Um, what are your responsibilities? Do you need to call and make an appointment for the patient for legal purposes or or um, uh, is there a protocol once once you discover something that you think is actionable? Yeah, that's, that's the million dollar question, right? So I'll, I'll start every, as a smart person ever does, I start every question with the answer of I'm not an attorney, I'm not a doctor, I'm not this. Um, that's the hard one because, you know, you can document everything perfectly. You're still, if that patient that you refer out either doesn't show up to get a biopsy or say the specialist doesn't do the biopsy, you're, you're still going to get lumped in that lawsuit. I mean, let's be honest about it. You're, it's just the way the law system works in the U.S. Everybody gets sued, and then they just kind of let everybody off the, off the, the, the hook. But the best thing is make sure that you document everything. Take pictures. If the patient says, no, I don't want to do a screening, you know, you don't have to make them sign a consent form, but write down in the chart, deny the screening. If you see something that they're concerned about, and then you send to a specialist, and the specialist sends them back to you, that's the concern nowadays. And that's really where cytology has been a big help. I was talking to an ENT earlier today, and he said, you know, what I do for my biopsies is I send them back a lot of times to the, to the, to the general dental office, and I say, look, why don't you do a cytology first? That kind of gets you off the hook that says you diagnosed it. If you did a cytology and it comes back negative, then you're kind of off the hook. And if it is positive, then send them to me for a biopsy. So the, the cytology really is, is something that helps in the office, but again, it's it's hard because you know the numbers are all skewed. If you look at all the data right now for the number of lawsuits in a lot of states, is failure to diagnose oral cancer is one of the top ones. But you're still doing your job. It's just that you know your your malpractice insurance settles before you ever go to court. So it looks like you lost. They just settle because they don't want to go to court. So it's it's a concern. But if you do the right thing and you document properly, you know, and somebody sues, then all they're going to do is settle, and that's what you pay the money for every year. So it's it's a hard question to answer, but I, I mean, that's usually what we recommend is making sure that you get everything you get done. You can do the test in your office, the cytology, and if, that's, if that all correlates and that's fine, then you can't really do anything more. Does that help? Excellent. Uh, yes, and that's all the questions I've got, Stu. I know uh, we had talked to Rob about um, giving our Crown Council guys an opportunity to uh, try this technology out. Do you want to tell them about that? Yeah, with with uh, with most of our our resource partners, um, the Crown Council team hopes to not only uh, educate, you know, uh, bring some sort of solution to you, but also uh, have an action plan. So now that you know something, it's your opportunity to go and do something. So that's kind of uh, where we transition to here as we end the webinar. Is what next? Um, what to do now. Uh, Rob gave you some great take-homes, which I hope we all listened to. The first one was, uh, you know, have you been screened yourself? Uh, I'm, uh, what a great take-home that I hope everyone will take to heart today. But uh, beyond that, we've arranged an exclusive arrangement um, just for Crown Council members with the, uh, the Forward Science Group. Um, the, their product, the, um, the ID for Life product, uh, can be uh, given to you the Crown Council members uh, you can start at no cost so normally it's hundred and fifty dollars a month and you can start your first month uh, at no cost uh, as a special arrangement from Rob and, and two Crown Council members so as you uh, email the the email uh, address that's in front of you there info at forward science uh, just make sure as Rob said reference that you're a Crown Council member 
and the forward science team will know uh, that $150 has been uh, waived as your startup fee uh, uh, as part of our exclusive agreement with them. So, uh, and and along with that, Rob's sales team will 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 take care of training uh, and everything that goes into the product um, to that Rob has talked about today to get your team started and, and to uh, move you in the right direction, which uh, we've had oral cancer screening companies before with Crown Council. And so it was a, it's been about three years since we've welcomed a new group that we felt fit our culture. Um, so Rob, we're grateful to have you and your team as, uh, as part of the, the Crown Council resource partners. So appreciate it. Well, thank you all for the opportunity and, and we look forward to uh, another Another great meeting next year with you guys and continue to evolve the partnership. All right, Rob. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody.